this hour is going to be a little bit less budget focused, although I'll talk a little bit about some um, cost saving strategies, but really just talk about chronic pain in the shelter and community medicine setting. I got some research updates from the crowdsourcing at the break. So Simbadol is um, $230 for a 10 mil bottle. So that's $23 per mil. But because it's 1.8 mg per mil, um, if you use a lower dose, um, it can potentially be cost effective depending on the dose you're using. But that would be off label. At the label dose, it remains pretty expensive. Um, the problem that I've had with it is that 24 hours of a cat on high dose buprenorphine after a spay is too much buprenorphine after a spay, and the cats are sort of very high and hot. But I think people are having better luck using lower doses, so it might be fun to play around with that. All right, so switching back to chronic pain, um, this is something that we haven't talked about very much in shelter or community medicine settings because mostly we're working with animals in, over a shorter term period of time, but it's becoming more and more relevant for us, and it's a major public health problem in people. Um, it's a feature of an aging population, so we're all getting older, um, and our animals are also getting older and living longer, um, so it's really important um, to maintain their quality of lives. It's increasingly recognized in veterinary patients, and as you have these animals with special needs that are having longer length of stay, I think it's becoming um, something that we have to all think about. And there is kind of a lot of different options. Um, since at least I went to school, there's a lot more things that can be considered. The official definition of chronic pain is that it lasts longer than six months in duration, but um, basically referring to changes at the central nervous system level that set the animal up for um, different responses to pain and painful stimulation throughout the rest of its life. And so this can have a considerable impact on animal quality of life. This is one of Martha Smith Blackmore's cases. So if you've ever seen her lecture, you've seen this picture before. Um, her name is Beatrice. Um, who, she was one of her um, animal sexual abuse victims that she had. And um, this dog had severe chronic osteoarthritis. And so certainly in making the case, because that person was actually convicted, um, the documenting the pain and the suffering that Beatrice would have experienced was really, really important for that legal case. This is a balance um, model of quality of life from Frank McMillan, which I really like to use, especially is helpful to talking to staff or pet owners. It just helps people think about an individual animal and how they're doing. And so on one side, you put all of the things for the animal that are good, and all the things for the animal that are bad go on the other side. So pain has a really significant impact on animal quality of life. So if we can take away their pain or help them manage their pain, we can keep them going for a much longer period of time. Typically, um, when we talk about chronic pain in veterinary patients, there's three sort of big categories. The big one is osteoarthritis. Um, then there's neuropathic pain, which we kind of alluded to a little bit um, in the last hour because neuropathic pain is part of all pain. And then there's cancer pain, which I'm not going to talk about today because most of us in community and shelter medicine don't spend a ton of time dealing with patients with cancer, although as we do more and more community-based work, we may be. In shelter and community settings, I think we do see a lot of trauma. A lot of animals coming to us with old injuries that weren't properly addressed at the time, and those animals are walking um, cases for chronic pain. Um, and then, of course, we're seeing a lot more older animals, animals that even five or ten years ago might not have stayed with us are now staying with us and getting adopted. My joke that I give when I speak um, across the country is that if you're a cat in Massachusetts, you're adoptable. It doesn't really matter how old you are or how many legs you have or eyes or what your viral status is, you are adoptable. Um, so, and then, of course, our law enforcement or neglect cases, it's really, really important that we treat and document any sources of pain. So osteoarthritis is a progressive degenerative syndrome affecting all of the joints. It's characterized by pain, disability, cartilage destruction, and bony remodeling over time. Um, it's the most common chronic condition, chronic pain condition of dogs. It's 20% of dogs over a year of age, which is one in five dogs have osteoarthritis. That's nine million dogs in the United States. Generally worse in the older, heavier, like us older, heavier adults, older, heavier dogs are also going to have challenges with arthritis. But 
even though we talk a lot about dogs, it's really, really under-recognized in cats. So you don't want to forget about the cats that they may have arthritis as well. And the signs in cats are particularly insidious. The dominant clinical sign of osteoarthritis is pain. Um, and this is because the joint is really rich with pain receptors, so it's a, a painful disease. And you think about like our shelter housing and some of these older creatures, and like, is there things that we can do to improve this dog's living conditions to help a dog that might have chronic pain? You know, getting that dog up on the floor with a carunda bed or a thicker bedding, I think is gonna be really, really important for these guys with joint disease. So the mechanisms of pain are really interesting. So you get synovitis, so that's literally inflammation of the joint. And as you destroy the joint, you get this continued release of destructive enzymes, and that breaks down cartilage, which sets up more damage, and so you create this cycle. And then you get the exposure of the subchondral bone and the formation of these osteophytes, which are those little things that the surgeons get so excited when they're doing the scopes that they're going to fish them out. And that's literally all I understand about it. But um, it causes pain. Um, and But you also have muscle components. So because the joint hurts, the animal changes the way they walk and the way they hold themselves. And so a lot of the pain is actually muscle pain. So they're clenching their muscles. Think about when you're really stressed and you're tightening your jaw. By the end of the day, your jaw is aching just from the tension. Um, and so that's a lot of the pain that these animals carry around them. And if you pay attention how animals walk and how they carry their head and how they go to lie down and get up, you can really see how it's affecting them. So um, this vicious cycle that I talked about, you get this initial joint pain that leads to changes in the nociceptive threshold and hyperalgesia. So as the disease progresses, um, less and less intense stimuli create pain in the patient. And then you continually release the inflammatory mediators, which further contributes to the cartilage damage. Um, and then as they get the pain and the arthritis, they don't want to exercise, they don't want to be mobile. That leads to them becoming overweight, and then their muscle um, is lost. They have muscle atrophy, which also increases the stress on the joints and increases the damage that is done. So it becomes this kind of vicious cycle, more and more inflammation, more and more hyperalgesia, more and more pain. So if you can keep the patient active um, and in good body condition, not overweight, not having muscle loss, they're going to be able to tolerate this osteoarthritis into their older years longer. And that's where I think we have a big role in sheltering because the, the disease is often very diagnosed very young. Like a lot of the dogs coming in to see us in the teaching hospital for their knees and their hips are one, two, three, four, five years of age. So if we talk to adopters about the ideal weight, if we remind our spay neuter clients that they need to cut the food by at least a third after the spay, like do you have language in your discharge that says now you need to decrease the amount that's fed because the dog is spayed or the cat is spayed? Um, we had our nutritionist formulate a little paragraph that we could add to help the students talk to the owners about cutting back on the food. Because if you talk to people, you find a lot of them are still feeding puppy food. And then we spay them, and then they go into their early adulthood chunk amongst, and they come in, these um, chubby dogs, and they're, you know, some of these owners in community medicine can't afford a $4,000 TPLO. You know, I can't afford a $4,000 TPLO. So we talk to the owners about their activity level and their weight from a young age. We can prevent some of this chronic pain that we're seeing later. Okay, that's my soapbox. So the pain features of chronic osteoarthritis are hyperalgesia, um, secondary hyperalgesia. So areas that aren't specifically associated with the joint are still painful because of all that muscle pain that they're carrying. Central sensitization, which is changes to the whole brain and spinal, um, spinal system so that future injury is more painful than it would be otherwise in a patient that doesn't have underlying osteoarthritis. And allodynia, which is when a non-painful stimulus like petting becomes painful. Explains a lot of things that happen with cats. Um, so the symptoms in dogs, you can see weight shifting. They may be insidious. Um, a lot of times it's just behavior. <clears throat> so for us, that can be really hard because we don't necessarily know the animal in front of us as to whether it's a normal behavior or not. But you can see aggression. You can see inappropriate elimination. You can see changes in appetite with cats. A big one that I used to see when I was in practice is they wouldn't jump on the counter. Um, and the owners don't really notice that. But if you ask them, like, does your cat jump on the counter, they'll go, oh, yeah, you know, he used to do that and he doesn't anymore. That's a cat that I'm worried about maybe living with some pain. Clinical signs, are, so for diagnosis, is mostly going to be on the clinical signs and on the physical exam. I put this line because if you look it up in a book, this is kind of the tests um, that are indicated, but in community medicine, we're 
pretty much appear in the no test. A lot of shelters, well, some shelters now have radiographs, so you may be getting x-rays, um, some shelters don't, and if you're in a, in a sort of community medicine setting, you may not be able to do that. So things like joint fluid, force plate analysis, and medication trial are more, more ivory tower. So usually we're going presumptive by signal mid age and clinical signs. So the goal of treatment <clears throat> is to control the pain and inflammation and help the patient regain normal function. Because if they can maintain that muscle mass, um, that will prevent further destruction and the secondary bone changes that I talked about. You want to prevent fibrosis and sort of the breaking down of that range of motion and preserve their ability to walk normally and maintain normal joint biochemistry as best you can. So sort of the classic triad of treatment for osteoarthritis is medications, exercise activity, and weight control. Um, so those include the anti-inflammatory agents, so mostly that's NSAIDs, um, and then the disease-modifying agents. Weight control is huge. Activity modification is huge. The things I put in white are the things that probably are not going to be available to all of us in this room. So physical therapy is very, very effective. Not a lot of my clients can afford physical therapy for their pets, but if they can, it's helpful. Surgery, that's my guys with their toys going in and getting the crap out of the joints. That also may not be an option for an animal in a community medicine setting. Um, and then some of the alternative therapies like shockwave therapies and things like that I'm not going to talk about. There are some alternative analgesics that you may not have considered for some of these chronic pain patients that I'm going to mention. So <clears throat> the mainstay of treatment is going to be the NSAIDs. They're pretty effective. They reduce joint pain and they decrease joint inflammation. Um, as we know, they work by decreasing prostaglandin synthesis through inhib inhibiting um, COX. Um, they also have central nervous system side of action as well. Um, one thing that's definitely true, and you just think about your own self, um, the efficacy of a particular NSAID is going to vary um, in a particular patient. So if you have a patient, you know, if you have a, like a standard it's carprofen in your hospital or your shelter, and you have a patient that's not responding well, you might want to think about just switching to one of the other ones. And sometimes after they've been on one NSAID for a number of years, just changing to a different NSAID after a washout period can um, improve the energy that they have. So that's an easy strategy to consider. For neuropathic pain, this is pain resulting from the structural changes within the peripheral and central nervous system. Um, and generally, we think of this as a primary lesion or dysfunction within the nervous system, which again, I mentioned in the last hour, that's kind of like all pain, right, as a lesion of the nervous system. Um, it, causes of neuropathic pain can be poorly managed acute pain. That's why we hammer so much on the preventative analgesia when we're talking about surgical pain. Um, chronic pain of any cause or any lesion within the nervous system. System. So some um, so it's, I have some examples coming up. So it's complicated. We don't understand it very well. It's very often a feature of chronic pain, so they kind of go together. Often you'll see a behavior change. And this is where you start to see kind of the emotional aspect of pain. The animal is not really feeling well. So they may present dull or they may present with um, unusual aggression or other behavior changes. Um, central sensitization, which is... Uh, you can think of it as an increased reactivity of the nervous system. So you're getting, um, you remember the, the word they use in school, like the sensitizing soup. All these mediators are getting released if you were in the body. So you're sort of geared up to be painful. Um, central disinhibition, so everything that would sort of calm the nervous system down is now sort of unleashed and everything is kind of hyperreactive. And you can see pain from a stimulus or pain just spontaneously arising. Um, and then you get the syndromes like the paresthesias or the dysthesias, which is, again, when things that really shouldn't be painful are presenting painful. Any patient with severe pain is at risk, and any injury to the peripheral or central nervous system is at risk. So to give you some examples, um, things like pelvic fractures, any of these limb amputations, anything along the back, especially something like a lumbar sacral injury or cauda equina syndrome, spinal cord injury, of course, disc disease, of course, FCE. And then um, some people think that one of the reasons why feline interstitial cystitis or whatever the heck the proper name of it is these days um, is such a problem is because of neuropathic pain. So it can be really hard to diagnose. So you should consider it anytime you have nerve injury. Um, anytime you have pain that's persisting, even though the injury itself is healed. Anytime you see allodynia, hyperalgesia, or dysthesia. Um, anytime you get an exaggerated response to palpation or pain with movement. And 
um, in humans, they do um, sort of a diagnostic test where they put the patient in the hospital and put them on a lidocaine CRI for 24 hours. Um, I've only done that, I think, one time in a dog. But um, that is one of the ways that it's diagnosed in people, is if they respond favorably to that. Um, so the way to handle it is prevention, right? So really being careful with our acute and perioperative pain management so that we reduce the incidence of peripheral and central sensitization, prevent those chronic changes, prevent that wind up from happening. That's why a multimodal regimen is so essential. But if you have a patient that you're trying to treat chronic pain or neuropathic pain, it may be lifelong treatment. So it's really important to express that to the owner that this isn't something like we're going to put you on your NSAID for two weeks and then you're all set. Like this is something they're going to be managing for that animal's life. So some of the treatments to consider, so gabapentin has an important role to play here. Uh, amantadine I'll talk about. The tricyclic antidepressants are often sort of pulled out. And then in green are sort of the things that are less available to us, like putting the patient in the hospital for an infusion. Um, but acupuncture, you know, more and more people are incorporating acupuncture into their practice, so that's certainly something you could consider. And other complementary techniques, you know, if you have a volunteer that does massage or if you can get them to, um, you know, chiropractic or anything like that. All of those things have a role to play if you can do it or access it. The typical drugs are going to be the NSAIDs, the nutraceuticals, or as they like to call them, the disease-modifying agents. Opioids is kind of more and more becoming less... Um, less of a go-to. There are times when you have an end-stage um, osteoarthritis case where that's really what the only thing that's going to work for the patient, but you try to delay that as long as possible um, or just use it intermittently if they're having like an acute flare-up. And MDA channel blockers are um, really helpful for, teaching, for treating central sensitization. That's kind of what they do. So amantadine is the oral NMD antagonist that you can use, gabapentin, antidepressants, and local anesthetics. We talked a lot about safe NSAID use in the first hour, and then I want to talk about it again more now. So you really should consider baseline lab work if you're going to be keeping the patient on an NSAID potentially for the rest of its life. Sort of the ideal would be we recheck it after a few weeks and then consider changing it out if you're seeing changes in the blood work, especially if the ALT is really going up. Um, if you're going to go from one NSAID to the next, you really want to do a washout period. I usually recommend at least three to five days before you change, which means you need to do another analgesic during that time to cover that. Never give an NSAID with concurrent aspirin or steroids. That's one of the biggest ways that you can get into trouble. And, um, you know, somebody asked me a question at the break about, well, what about chronic oral dosing of meloxicam in cats? Because I know that they do that in other countries. And and I said, my response was, I didn't change what I did when the black box came out. We've always used oral meloxicam chronically in cats at the lowest dose. We titrate it down to the lowest dose, maybe even lower than 0.05 mg per kg, and as infrequently as possible to keep the cat comfortably. So that could be weekly. That could be every three to four days. Um, it's about owner and adopter education, right? So you're informing the owner that this is off-label use, that there are side effects, there are risks to this medication, but this is a quality of life intervention for this cat. We're putting your cat on this cat because your cat has pain, and let the owner make an informed decision, and then monitor that cat. The ways you can minimize toxicity, alternate your dose schedule. So try to use the minimum effective dose you can. Use GI protectants. Pretty weak evidence for that. Things like Pepsid, um, um, cimetidine, those will not prevent ulcers in patients on NSAIDs. There is some evidence for uh, protein pump inhibitors and mesoprostol uh, preventing ulcers in some patients, so sometimes we do do it. Um, the biggest thing you can do to avoid toxicity is never give an NSAID to a patient who's dehydrated. So always make sure they're hydrated. And then if you do have a patient with some chronic kidney changes, that, but they're also painful, that's a risk-benefit discussion with the owner. And maybe you're going to be giving them sub-Q fluids or something else to make sure they're not getting dehydrated while they're NSAID. And make sure they're educated about stopping the medication if the patient gets sick. So if they're vomiting or something else is going on, they need to contact you about what to do about their NSAID. In community medicine, this can be really tough. So this dog, whose name escapes me, was a Scotty dog that we had treated um, in our outreach program. So this is at public housing. Um, so this woman lived in a public housing owned apartment, which was on the third or fourth floor. And the Scotty dog developed some kind of heinous 
paw mass, and he couldn't, he was really, really overweight, which you can't appreciate in the picture. He couldn't walk up and down the stairs um, because of the mass, and so his pain of his foot was really, um, was really affecting his quality of life, and she couldn't really afford diagnostics. So we were able to get him into the clinic and get an aspirin, and it was some bad thing. She couldn't afford the surgery, and the prognosis was poor anyways, but we did put him on carprofen, which really improved his quality of life. And at least he could go up and down the stairs to go outside with her because she didn't have a car. He's in um, my outreach worker's car in this picture. So for her, that was the biggest thing. Like he needed to be able to get out of the apartment and go outside with her. Um, and so no, we weren't monitoring his blood work <laughs> to see for changes with the carprofen. And this wasn't going to be you know, a forever solution. But to improve his quality of life for the short term, it was really, really important. So we may or may not be running lab work even though we decided to put them on the drugs. We need to make sure that our owners understand um, the risk benefit of the drugs we're putting them on, especially if there's a language barrier. That can be a problem. Um, can we get them over the counter meds? What over the counter meds are they using? Are they, are, they un, are they misunderstanding what we're saying and using something like ibuprofen, which would be like really toxic in the dog? So we need to be really clear that they can't just go to the grocery store and buy something, that we need to give them the one for dogs. Um, can the owner get the medications into them? Can they get them on a consistent dosing interval? And what if there is a problem? You know, what if Scott, I think his name was Scotty, the Scotty, something original like that. What if Scotty gets diarrhea on a Saturday? Saturday. You know, she's going to call my ER and they're going to tell her it's $300. She's going to have a car. So what's my plan for how we're going to manage any side effects with Scotty if we put him on this medication? So sort of the summary is it's not a benign intervention. The possibility of side effects is real, but the potential to really improve the animal's quality of life is huge. So that's where we have to use our best judgment and do the best we can under the circumstances we find ourselves in. Not going to talk too much about the disease modifying agents, um, sort of in the realm of quackery, um, but a lot of us do believe in them. I have seen good results with a lot of them. Um, the ideal agent would enhance car cartilage metabolism, um, decrease enzymatic activity within the joints, prevent formation of periarticular fibrin or thrombi. To date, we don't have the perfect one of these. Um, all of the available agents are sort of thought to support joint health, and they're, they're all very safe. You do need to be a little bit careful if you have an animal with a coagulopathy or um, if the animal is sensitive to them. But we've had pretty good luck with like the Cosquin for cats and the Dasquin for dogs and things like that. So I usually throw them in. Um, there's a lot of range of products, so as best as possible, Possible. You want to get a product that someone has done an evaluation to that what's in it, that it has in it what it said is in it, which is one of the best reasons to use um, a product from a company that you trust to make sure that it actually has in it what they say. Some of the newer, newer, they're not new, but newer options for chronic pain are the NMDA channel blockers, the gabapentin, the antidepressants, and local anesthetics. I wanted to talk a little bit about galaprant or it's um, grepaprant, which is a newer um, anti-inflammatory that people are using in general practice. I haven't seen too many people using it in the shelter, and I never see patients coming in on um, the spay neuter clinic on this. But I do sometimes see patients in the teaching hospital come in on this. And this is a novel drug. It targets just the PGE2. Um, so it's a selective EP4 receptor antagonist. So it does not inhibit COX. So because it's sort of further down in the pathway, it's got a more specific target. And so it looks like it's more, um, less chance of side effects. So for some of these older dogs that may have some kidney or liver dysfunction, this might be the um, drug of choice. Or some people use it as the first thing they go to, if the, if, especially if it's a younger dog, if they think they're going to need to put the dog on it for a long time, like years and years and years, um, then they... Um, then they've been going to this. When it first came out, they had some problems with the formulation of the tablets, and so people were having trouble getting it. And I think that sort of delayed kind of the uptake because people kind of they, they did all the splash of it, and then it sort of people forgot about it. But now it's sort of sort of steadily gaining traction. So that's an option if you have a dog that you're not sure you're comfortable starting an NSAID, but you want to start one on. And, and um, so far, I think people are having pretty good luck with it. Tylenol, so remember that dogs can take acetaminophen, cats cannot. This is often the first drug choice for people because it is pretty well tolerated. It's not an anti-inflammatory, however. So it's just an analgesic. So it's useful if the patient has good liver function but can't tolerate GI side effects 
or if you're switching from one NSAID to the next NSAID, you could use acetaminophen. Um, you can also use it with another NSAID because it's a diff totally different mechanism of action. So you can add acetaminophen onto a patient that's already on an NSAID and you're struggling with it. Um, so the dose is 10 to 15 mg per kg twice a day. There is injectable paracetamol, which is essentially the same thing. It's used really commonly in Europe. Um, and so that is something that we could use perioperatively if we don't, if we have, especially if we have a patient that can't tolerate an NSAID, but we're looking for another analgesic. In people, there's a lot of NSAID narcotic combinations. So Tylenol-3 is acetaminophen combined with codeine, and that has been used with some success in chronic pain in dogs. This is kind of like my last ditch thing um, for dogs with end-stage arthritis or end-stage cancer pain. So we're not using this very often. It's obviously controlled. Um, in veterinary medicine, you can kind of come up with something similar. Sometimes people call this combination tramadil. So there is some evidence that you can improve the analgesic efficacy of tramadil when you give it with an NSAID. So tramadol and carprofen together probably works better than tramadol alone. Sure. Her question is whether I've seen any increase in ulceration with tramadol and rimadol together. I have not. Have you? Yeah, I haven't, but um, we, we're kind of getting away from tramadol in our clinic anyways, and we're kind of replacing it with gabapentin, um, so I don't have a ton of experience with it. So amantadine is an oral NMDA antagonist, which is very similar to ketamine. Um, and it, there's at least one study that showed if you put a chronic arthritis patient on amantadine with their NSAID that they have improved pain scores. Um, and it's, the dose is just three mg per kg once a day, um, and it's relatively inexpensive, and you can script it out from a human pharmacy. No, it's not controlled. Tricyclic antidepressants, so amitriptyline, um, they work by blocking catecholamine reuptake, enhance um, adrenergic transmission, and they also work at the NMDA receptor. So these can be um, effective at lower doses. Um, so if you have a case that's been on a lot of medications and it has refractory pains, it's something that can be tried. And then, of course, we can't forget about our non-pharmacologic options and finding ways to access these for our patients. So things like weight loss, improving their nutrition, getting a nice exercise regime, physical therapy, massage, and water therapy are really wonderful for patients. It's going to be cost prohibitive for a lot of my patients, although massage anybody can do um, if you learn how to do it properly. Um, and then acupuncture, e-stim, cold laser are really popular, um, but again, there's a big cost associated with them. Okay, so kind of flew through that. So I'm going to now give you kind of a case, and I should have like tons of time for questions. Um, so this was a case that we had to deal with in our hospital um, recently um, that really kind of challenged us to sort of think through um, what we were doing for um, chronic pain. So this was, her name was Pepper, and she was a young um, Black and Town coonhound. And her history was she had been transported up from a southern state to New England by a rescue group. She was, of course, heartworm positive, so we're already in trouble there. Um, and she was 40 days pregnant. I don't know if you can see kind of in the picture this giant belly. Um, she had a history of multiple gunshot wounds. So she had a shattered left hind limb um, and a chronic non-healing fracture of the right humerus. The bullet's actually still in her right humerus. So um, a, lot of, a lot of elbow pain. So she's already set up for chronic pain from before she even got to us. So she came in for workup. So she has a chronic open comminuted fracture of the distal left tibia. Um, she has severe left elbow degenerative joint disease secondary to the malunion fracture of the humerus. She's heartworm positive, she's pregnant, and she has tapeworms just for fun. Um, so the, own, the rescue was offered the option of amputation of the high limb as kind of a salvage, but because her forelimb is in such bad shape, they really wanted to try to keep this dog with all four limbs and apparently have an unlimited budget for her. So the decision was made to go forward with surgery, even though she was late-term pregnant. So she came in, she was on antibiotics, of course, she was on tramadol, 
um, and gabapentin um, at 10 mg per kg every eight hours. No NSAID, why? Yeah, go ahead, question. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't we just euthanize a dog? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair question. Um, <laughs> she, the dog actually was doing pretty well, like attitude-wise, and she, there's a good outcome to the case. But I do think we need to ask ourselves that um, every time. You know, what what are we what are we doing? Yeah, the dog's adoptable, right? In Massachusetts, she's adoptable. Yeah. So why no? And yes. Her question is, why didn't they just euthanize the dog? So again, I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm not involved with those decision making. My job is to get the dog through surgery and keep her as comfortable as possible. But fair question, like we need to ask that every time, right? Is is it and are we going to get to a good place with this dog, um, and and at what expense, right? So why no NSAID? Because she's pregnant, right? Good. She was. Again, okay, another ethical question. Why didn't they just spay her? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, and wow, okay, we're getting way off the topic for pain. But, um, but in Massachusetts, right, we need puppies. We're bringing puppies all the time. So that's this hot, this is this hot topic of where we are now, right? So, yeah, and the, and the puppies had heartbeats. And the whole, like, all the students, everyone is, like, bond. I know, she's rolling, she's, yeah. Yeah, this is the world we're living in now. So. I don't know what antibody she was on. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay, so fast forward to March, and she has surgery to place external fixator on her left tibia. Um, I put her protocol there just for your interest. So we have hydromorphone, aspromazine, ketamine, propofol, and epidural with buprenorphine and bupivacaine, LKCRI, and she did need dopamine. So obviously with the trying to save the puppies, huge risk to put this dog. I looked at her anesthesia record last night. So three hours of anesthesia for this dog. Um, and keeping her blood pressure up is a lot more critical because of the puppies. Three weeks later, 15 puppies are born. Um, this is the puppy, though. Look how cute it is. And all the puppies were adopted. So I know, I know, yeah. But look, there she is with her X-Fix on. Um, so in May, she's doing really well. She comes in for her six-week recheck. And she's not on any meds, which is, should be a red flag, right? After we talked about all the problems with this potential dog for chronic pain for her life, she's just on gabapentin, which the foster person was giving her kind of when the spirit moved her. Um, once the puppies were weaned, they did start pepper on carprofen. Um, so that's Pepper at about that time. Um, you know, she's a little bit harassed by all those puppies. I think one puppy died, but 14 puppies have now been adopted. So pretty good quality of life, playful, going for walks with the mom, playing with the other dog, like happy dog at this point. Yes, we still have to deal with the heartworm. Um, then a little bit of a wrinkle here. So at June, she comes in. She's not bearing any weight on the leg, and she's lethargic at home. Um, so they take the x-rays. This picture's kind of crappy, but you can see her kind of here. Like She's got the big bandage on the leg, and she's a little bit sad. Um, they took x-rays, and now it's infected. So um, she really hasn't been using the leg. She's not really able to do the things that she wanted to do. Um, so. My concern at this point was we really hadn't been treating her appropriately as a patient that's going to, she's going to need lifelong management for chronic pain. So yes, we have to get the infection under control. So they cleaned it up, they cultured, we restarted antibiotics, I think it was clindamycin. Um, so now she's on carprofen, gabapentin at a higher dose three times a day, amantatine every day, and then tramadol for breakthrough pain. So this is her after the antibiotics, so she's happy now, rolling around on the grass, consistent um, pain medications really helped her, and her energy, her attitude improved. So now, ethics aside, she's in a long-term foster home, 
um, and doing well, but you know she's still not out of the woods as far as whether she's going to get to keep that leg. Um, and she's very high risk for chronic pain, right? Because she still has the elbow thing to deal with um, in the front. But um, yeah, so that's the kind of thing that is adoptable in Massachusetts nowadays, um, and it creates a challenge for us to do good to do good medical management for this dog. Um, I haven't looked at her bill. Oh, we did spay her, by the way. Um, <laughs> we did spay her at the, one of the rechecks when she was doing well, so she spayed. Um, but to kind of come up with what you can do in your setting, that, that definitely was a challenge for us, um, even with the rescue that's pretty committed and had a big budget. And they're interesting conversations, right? It's interesting conversations with your students. Are we doing the right thing? How do we know if we're doing the right thing? So that's actually all I have. So I have 20 minutes for Q&A, which should be plenty of time. Yes? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Her comment was about rehab and that, like, there's a lot you can do with rehab that's very, um, very affordable and available. So things like heat therapy, cold therapy, um, just gentle massage, range of motion. Um, and so that's a great exercise to do with students and things that we can do um, pretty much in any setting. So very well said. Yes? Do you have an opinion about CBD products? Oh, that was, that was definitely recorded. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, I was hoping you'd ask a different question the second time. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like the hot topic of the moment, right? And so it's a struggle because we, don't, we still don't have a lot of research. We don't have a lot of evidence. But like our patients, our clients are using them. Um, so personally, I don't know that I have. I mean, I've tried to educate myself by reading as much as I can, and it seems like they may be helpful in certain situations. Um, but I don't, I, where I get uncomfortable is I don't feel like I have good advice to give the clients. Like, I'm not that comfortable as far as like what to look out for in terms of toxicity. There are some pretty good resources, like the AVMA has a, um, a website specifically targeting this and they're trying to give us some better guidance. But as far as I know, we're not technically allowed to prescribe them. They're not, they're not legal for dogs. So it's really hard for me to, especially when I'm being recorded, to give any kind of like, <laughs> advice about that. Um, so I, I think we need to do more research. That's well, going to be my cop-out answer. Well, right. So part of the reason I'm asking is because a company contacted us recently with some, you know, original research that was actually done here at Cornell. Yeah. They said it was published in Frontiers. I don't know if that's Frontiers. somewhat sketchy. Highly like peer-reviewed. Oh, you do? Okay. No, no. No, it hasn't. No, yeah. Sarcastic. Okay. Right. I was like, oh, did I just say something bad? I don't want to feel bad. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with that. Is it legit? Yeah. I mean, I think there is a lot of research going on, and I think the companies are highly motivated to get people to be using it. Um, and I think a lot of humans that suffer from chronic pain um, are presenting pretty compelling cases that they um, that it's effective. But until we have labeled doses, and until we have evidence about OK, so you can do a study and tell me that it's effective in this setting, in this research model at Cornell, but what do I do with my patient that's already on six other medications? What do I advise the owner? So for me, I'm really uncomfortable. That's like out of my realm. And, I, and a full disclosure, too, I don't treat chronic pain regularly, right? I'm a spay-neuter person. So if you went to a lecture with a, one of these chronic pain experts, I think that's, those are the people that are going to be able to give us the information, because they're going to be managing cancer dogs and cats long term and with all those other ed medications and letting us know from there. But I don't know that we have that yet. So s cautiously skeptical, willing to learn is kind of where I'm at now. And, and hoping that we can get better laws to have some def defensibility about it. Because again, I think AVMA's position is we're not allowed to dispense, we're not allowed to prescribe, we're not allowed to advise. So that doesn't really give us much of a backup. So that, that needs to change. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, 
so I don't have a lot of experience using amantadine. Um, is that something you can use in combination with NSAIDs and tramadol? Yeah. And what kind of side effects do you normally see with that? The biggest side effect that we see of all these things would be sedation, which honestly I don't see much. And the other frustration I have with it doesn't seem to do anything. But um, all of these things, that each thing you add is going to kind of help a percentage. So I pull that in for a patient that's been on an NSAID for a long time and they, it's not working as well. There is that one study that Duncan LaSalle did that showed that the NSAID and the amantadine together works better. So you can definitely give that. So that's, that's not a first line. It's like a third line. Let me add it in. But what we know about ketamine is that it works the best if you give it before, during, and after the injury. So that's kind of the theoretical reason why you would think to go to amantadine. Like a dog like Pepper seems like she should have gone home on amantadine after the surgery because you're trying to address the central sensitization as she goes forward. Um, so that's where you would want the amantadine with your NSAID, with your gabapentin, potentially with something else as well. So a lot of these dogs end up being on six or seven medications in the end. Yeah, you were next. Um, I see that you mostly discussed Push the button. Any thoughts of switching to another lateral movement? Lots of cam still fairly inexpensive. For a particular patient or in general? Yeah, so as I mentioned, that's kind of the first thing I would do. So if you have had a patient been on any particular NSAID for any length of time, then you would, you would switch to another NSAID as the first thing you would try. As I mentioned, you want to do a washout period, usually three to five days, and then try the other one. For sure, there are certain patients that are going to respond to one versus the other. In my clinic, we default to carprofen for dogs because it's the cheaper one. It's kind of what I showed you the last hour. For the little dogs, it gets a little bit hard to dose. So we're going to pull out Mopscam for the little dogs just because of ease of dosing. But I don't have a strong opinion one versus the other as far as general use in spay neuter or general use in acute pain. It's more, for me, it's going to be going by the cost. So the, the carprofen was down to like a dollar per mil, I think. So that's why we would go with that one. We do use generic meloxicam for our cats. So I don't have like, I don't have a hat in any NSAID ring. All NSAIDs are good and bad. Yeah. I was at an orthopedic class, and they were talking about, it was for TTAs, um, the guy was out of Europe, but he used in every surgery um, line blocks with a lidocaine with epinephrine in it uh -huh. to decrease bleeding. Um, do you have any comments on that? Like, would you use that as a line block for a spay or something, and then you could use it preoperatively or perioperatively? Sure. Um, so a lot of people add um, vasoconstrictors, most commonly epinephrine, to lidocaine to... Um, to cause vasoconstriction. It's not really that much for the bleeding, really. It's mostly because if you have vasodilation, it's going to increase uptake of the local away from the area you want it to stay. So if you use a vasoconstrictor, it will keep it in the area where you want it to stay. In spay neuter, we actually call that a Bushby block, because Phil Bushby does that a lot for neuters, where he mixes the epinephrine with the lidocaine, and that helps with the bleeding and helps keep the local right in the area. You got to be really careful, so never, ever put a vasoconstrictor in the periphery. So if you're doing like um, a toe amputation or anything in the ear, something like that, you got to be careful because if you inhibit peripheral circulation, you can have tissue sloughing. And so most of us don't routinely use vasoconstrictors in our locals, but if you have a particular situation where you're worried that you really want it to stay there or like the Bushby situation is usually for bleeding post-neuter is when he uses that. So it's, it's fine and it's um, sort of standardly done in the dental blocks. So if you're doing any dentistry with dental blocks, it's a good idea to put the vasoconstrictor in there, and that will prolong the duration of action because it stays in the area longer. Yeah. The use of splash blocks in routine spays and neuters, do you advocate for that? Is it better to just do a line block? Um, yeah, I, every single time I lecture at any sort of conference with any sort of spay people, they always ask me about splash blocks. It's really funny. Um, so yeah, I think if you look in the literature, there's like not good evidence that they work. And so you find yourself getting into arguments with people who are yelling at you about how they don't work or like surgeons yelling at you because you're coming in trying to splash things. Um, in my when I use flashbacks, it's because the animal's like flying off the table and everybody is like 
grabbing purple fall and screaming and drama's happening. And I wander up and splash lidocaine and the animal doesn't react to surgery anymore. So I think they work. Um, I think that you want to be thoughtful about the dose. Make sure you stay below the toxic dose and think about where you're putting it. As long as you stay below the toxic dose and are careful, I put them in the category of things that in my hands seem to work. Are there better things that we could be doing? Possibly more strategic, more precise, more targeted. Um, is it going to hurt them? Very unlikely. So why wouldn't you do it if you have the time? And as I mentioned in the first hour, it's pennies of money. So it's not going to hurt anything. And you might as well try. And I feel like it probably helps. The problem, I think, is that you shouldn't rely on a splash block of lidocaine to really get you very far into the post-operative period because the duration of action is short. So if you're looking for short term, let me help them out right now, or preventative, let me make sure that I'm not creating anything towards wind up, then I think you're good. If it's like your linchpin of post-op analgesia, I think that's when it's a problem. The other thing that I want to mention is that if you're reading the literature, it's really, really hard to do good pain studies, right? Because we don't do untreated controls because that's not ethical. So most animals in pain studies are on multiple pain medications. So anytime you read anything that says that something doesn't work, you always want to ask yourself, did it not work? Or could they not prove that it worked, which is a different scenario. So if anyone challenges you like, oh, there's no evidence that it works, then I would go back to, is there any evidence that it's harmful? And if it isn't harmful and it's cheap and it might help, why wouldn't you do it? Um, on, on the same topic, would you advise doing splash blocks like on the pedicles during a spay or just in the incision after you close the I mean, radio? I think the one paper that showed good effect, I, th I think in that paper, if I'm not misremembering, they did the incision and then they sort of dripped it along the body wall sort of towards the pedicle. So I don't know that like visualizing the pedicle and dripping it on there is going to be time efficient, but kind of putting it in that area I think is okay. I think the most important thing is make sure that you're well below the toxic dose. And the more vascular you are, the increasing the potential for toxicity. So you want to be pretty cautious with what you put on the pedicle, but you can do it. Um, amputations. Is there a benefit to doing like a full four-quarter or high limb amputation versus like a mid-humeral or mid-femoral amputation? Mm, that um, is a surgery as as question. Post-op. I'm just thinking like from your experience with post-op pain um, and pain chronic wise, pain. I feel like they do better when you take the whole leg. But I think that's a question. There's like a lot of surgeons in here. Any surgeons want to take that one? They're just laughing. <laughs> Thoughts? <laughs> Okay. Oh, surgeon agrees with me. I love it. <laughs> so she didn't push her button, but she said she's done both, and she feels that the complete limb is less painful. So, yeah, I love it when surgeons agree with me. It's rare. <laughs> Any other? Yeah, in the back. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. I'm sort of embarrassed to ask, oh, but do come you on. do? I got hammered. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> do you um, do testicular blocks? Preoperative on the cats? Yes. Do you do a splash block afterwards? No. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. You were next. Um, you mentioned in the first half um, long term opioid use. Uh -huh. What do you consider long term? Well, so with regards to long term opioid use, I have to say that my thoughts on that have really changed from. 10 years ago when I was actively managing chronic pain cases in my other life to now where I rarely do it. At the time, I, I can remember in particular um, a couple of Labradors, there was Labradors, with really bad chronic arthritis. And one of them really needed her buprenorphine. And so I was highly bonded with this owner. I knew her really well. She called me every day. So she had like a pharmacy in her you know, house. And so, um, Ebony was her name. Ebony would get oral transmucosal buprenorphine a couple times a day. And that owner could tell a difference. And she would call me when the dose needed to be adjusted or not. So that's what I've done in the past. I, I would be probably less likely to do that now just because of the cost and availability. But there probably are patients that need it. 
I've also done codeine um, or like the Tylenol 3. And there are some studies in dogs with the pharmacology and it's pretty tricky because of the um, first pass effect to get good dosing, but there are some, some people have had some success with those. I think, um, you know, they're still sort of the gold standard for severe pain. It's just that they have so many side effects, it's kind of like our last choice. So, and that was definitely, you know, she was terminally affected by her, her pain at that point. So are you talking like a few weeks? Few um, Ebony was, it was months, yeah, months. But again, that was pretty rare, you know, that was like more of a specialty situation. Yeah, end term, for sure. And I know cats, you know, if you have a cat that's not doing, you really don't want to put on an NSAID. I know people have done similar things with cats. Usually now they're on gabapentin, but they'll do low dose buprenorphine sort of as needed at the end, yeah. Yeah. When you suspect a animal has a chronic pain state and you're spaying and neutering them, how would you alter your usual? Oh, hi, um, Kathy. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So if they're, if they're chronically, if they have chronic pain coming in for spaying and neutering, so like an older pet that you're spaying and neutering or somebody like Pepper, um, Hmm. I don't know that I have. I probably should have. Um, I think I would maybe go more towards, like, because we use a lot of propofol in our clinic just because it's easy for induction. But if I have a patient that is going to be more painful, like, more commonly for me, it's because they're going to do a pexy or because it's, like, a big dog and, you know, it's a younger less experienced surgeon. But if it's another reason, too, I might more lean towards ketamine, midazolam, at, in my induction or putting ketamine with my propofol in my induction so that I have that preventative effect just to make sure that nothing about the surgery triggers any wind up for them. And then talking about their whole regimen, so maybe they're going home on an NSAID for sure and gabapentin for sure and then f more follow up to see how they're doing is probably what I would do. Yeah, that's a great question. Think about that. Uh, yeah, I think you were next. Um, so if, I think you had mentioned that you did the ket dex be for the um, spay neuters for mm -hmm. cats in particular. Yep. Um, and I assume that you're individually dosing that per cat as you Correct. go. Yep. What would you guys suggest for like high volume spay neuter clinics for um, pain management and cost at the same time? As so that's my protocol for our sort of pseudo high volume clinic. So that's what we use for all of our cats. And we're, you know, we're talking like 30 cats. So we're not like as high volume as some, but we're not as low volume as like a normal practice. Any of those other protocols, like people like the TTDEX, um, for the community cats, we're still doing a TKX. So I think most people are using one of those cocktails, and everyone has their favorite. Um, so any of those would be fine. Yeah. And I didn't price them all out just because I didn't, you know, that was a lot of math. Yeah. Do you have any opinions on Bupesar, the compounded three-day formula from Zoo Farm? Yeah, that, came, that question came up at the break. So um, again, my, my, I can't get anything compounded in my hospital, so I can't comment from personal experience. Um, I know that when I talk to people that use it, they're very happy with it, um, and that it's giving them you know, longer duration of action, and that they can get it, and it's um, affordable. Um, there are a couple of case reports of injection site reactions in cats, so I think sort of the the anesthesiologists are a little conservative because they've heard those case reports, but when I talk to practitioners, I've heard mostly good reports, but I don't have any personal experience with it. Um, there, you know, depending on how, what it is, like I think that for spay neuter, it may be overkill, you know, for sure, like you don't necessarily need days of an opioid after a cat spay, but if you're contemplating a bigger surgery and you have bupesr, or you're doing full mouth extractions or something like that, that's when I feel like it, you're gonna really find it useful. And in community medicine where you're like, I see you and I send you away, maybe never again, it's kind of has an appeal because you know that they're covered as long as they're, you know, not zonked. Yeah. Um, for orthopedic procedures on the hind end, are you doing epidurals? And if so, what are you using now? Because when I was in school, it was like morphine, <clears throat> lidocaine, bupivacaine. So her question is about epidurals, which um, we struggle with that, honestly, at the vet school as far as like, is an epidural a day one competency? Like, do we need to teach our students to do epidurals? Are you going to be doing them in general practice? And I feel like, that 
it should be, like they should be doing them, depending on the kind of procedures that they're doing. It's just that we have so much else to teach them. So I kind of have to let people tell me, you know, whether they're doing epidurals. If you're moving towards a lot more surgeries, especially hind limb amputation, that's a very useful technique. Um, we used to do preservative free morphine, which again is like an ivory tower drug that you're not gonna have in community practice. But right now we're doing buprenorphine and bupivacaine, which all of us have. So if you're comfortable and you know the anatomy, and there's lots of good CE, like there's a lot of CE wet labs and things if you're doing a lot of orthopedic surgery or amputations where it would be useful. Um, the benefit is um, you don't need to use a lot of other things. So you can do that procedure pre-op and then their dog is very comfortable, or cat very comfortable post-op. Things like PUs or unblocking cats. Now there's um, a, a paper that describes the caudal epidural technique, which you can do with lidocaine. That's really, really effective for unblocking, and people are nodding their heads, so people are doing those things. So yeah, if you're comfortable with the technique or your technicians are, I think it's, it's certainly something that we can look towards. Interestingly, with the noceta, you know, I think the best thing is an epidural and noceta, but very often we're doing one or the other, and the dogs that have the noceta and not the epidural are also pretty comfortable. Um, I'm pretty conservative with my bupivacaine dose, and I'm um, playing around with it right now because you will get hypotension. Um, it's because it's also effective intra-op, so it will really decrease the amount of anesthetic that you need to use. So if you're trying something new like that, you want to be careful and really monitor your patient closely because they might not react like you expect. All right, we have time for one more question. Yes, saw you first. Um, so I'm wondering about heartworm treatment. I feel like malarcemine injections are one of the most pain-inducing things that yeah. I do. Anything that you suggest for prevention and then treatment with or without steroids, yeah. kind of best options there? I don't have a ton of experience with that. We've been trying to get um, something that would be affordable that rescues could do that would allow our students to practice it. And cardiology came back with like $1,200. And the rescues are like, no. Um, so we're kind of working through that. I know from personal experience, we used to give them sedation and then we gave them carp carprofen. And so that's kind of what's in our protocol. But I don't have like a set of dogs to say like, yeah, I thought that worked great or no, it didn't. So so um, I don't know if other people have thoughts, but I think they need something for sure. And I think most of us do carprofen, but how they do with or without. I've, then I've heard also some people say, oh, they're fine. And other people say, no, it's horrible. So, um, so I haven't really collected my own data to really help with that. Yeah, you have thoughts? Yeah, I His comment was with diravan, yeah. yeah diravan. Then the imidacide, interesting. Yeah. Thoughts on heartworm treatment? No, it is. Is, is it on? Is there a green light? Yeah. yeah. There, you're on. Uh, anyway, um, on heartworm treatments, we would ice them for 10 minutes after we did the injections, like, and that seemed to help with local reaction. And then they went home on. Uh, gabapentin. We did try it all yeah. for a bit, but it didn't seem to do anything. Yeah. We'd add carprofen if we got reports back from the owners, but we did a community one, but yeah. the icing seemed to So be ice, good. gabapentin, carprofen. So ice the area for 10 minutes is a great idea. All right. I'll be happy to answer any more at the break, and thank you guys.